Joining us now on the line from New York, New York, ta Coates. He is contributing editor for The Atlantic Magazine and the author of The Beautiful Struggle, A Father, Two Sons, and an Unlikely Road to Manhood. And ta as I welcome you to the program, I, I thought we'd just start by, for those of our viewers who don't know about your background, starting with that and just getting some of that on the record. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. I grew up there in the late 80s and the early 90s. Uh, beautiful city just north of uh, D.C., now made famous by The Wire. I don't know if you guys get that up there. We but. sure do. HBO, yeah, okay. great show, yeah. great show. And who is your dad? My dad is uh, William Paul Coates. He was a publisher, uh, also a, a, a member of the Black Panther Party uh, in the late 60s and the early 70s. Um, and much of what I write about in the book that you mentioned, A Beautiful Struggle, is just uh, coming up in West Baltimore in those times, and also his own struggle with the Panthers in his time and how, they, how he brought that to bear as a father. How much did his being a Black Panther, how much of an impact did that have on your upbringing? Well, I had a serious impact. Uh, I think anytime you go through something that uh, serious, uh, it, it shapes you. My dad was a Panther uh, in his 20s, a, a formative period. He was coming out of Vietnam. Uh, uh, had become radicalized uh, in Vietnam and after Vietnam. Uh, and even after he left the Panther Party and moved on to other things, I think it, it, it had a great impact in terms of shaping his politics, uh, his awareness of how race plays out in this country. And he really passed that on to his kids. Your dad, I think, also had, what was it, seven children with four different women? And I, That's I, exactly right. I wonder yep. if, did, did you think that was normal at the time? I did. I did, in fact. I, I knew we had a big family. Um, the thing that I thought was abnormal was that my dad lived with me. I thought that was abnormal, <laughs> uh, given, uh, again, the, uh, the times I was coming up in. Um, I knew other people who had, maybe not in so much that, that situation, but who had uh, uh, brothers and sisters that were by other, other parents. And we have an impression of, of the Baltimore of the day. We're talking 1970s, 1980s here. Uh, mm -hmm. Tough, drugs, gangs, violent. Did you see that? I did. It was impossible not to see that uh, if you were going to live in Baltimore. Uh, my, my neighborhood was a fairly working class, reasonably safe neighborhood, uh, but the city's an organism. Everything's connected. Um, and so if you're going to attend public schools, unless you're going to have your child in a situation in which you shut them in the house 24-7, uh, uh, you're definitely going to see some of that. Now here's where your story gets a little unorthodox, and I'd like to read an excerpt from a piece that you wrote for Time Magazine in 2005. It goes like this. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I had an awful jump shot and no sense of rhythm. I collected comics and played Dungeons and Dragons. I was the opposite of the stereotypical image of a black kid. My most tangible link, the one that repeatedly saved me, was the music. In short, I was a black music nerd, for sure out of love, but also out of a need to find some common ground with my own. And that's what I want to pick up on. How much of a struggle was it for you to find, as you put it, that common ground with my own? I'm not sure it was any more of a struggle than any other white kid in, 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 in a similar circumstances. I think, uh, be they black music nerds or white music nerds, they usually have somewhat of a struggle to find uh, some commonality uh, with the broad mainstream of being a kid. Uh, mine obviously has some particular instances, being how race is reflected, being that the black community is a particular community. Uh, but I'm not sure that it was any, any harder than it was for any other kid who grew up collecting comic books and uh, worshiping at the altar of music. But most black kids at the time didn't do that, right? That, they, they, black kids at the time were not into Dungeons and Dragons. You were into more sort of stereotypical, if you like, white stuff. You know why? Yeah, I would hesitate to call it white stuff, though. I actually, I actually would hesitate to call it. I mean, maybe, maybe Dungeons and Dragons, that's about it. That wasn't too typical. But I think, again, I, I've, I've found this as I've, as I've gone out into the, world, into the world on my blog and talked with other people who came up playing Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't normal to play Dungeons and Dragons anywhere. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you have any Dungeons, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons players on your staff, but I'm sure they have stories, uh, certainly, of, uh, of, of being outcasts for, for doing that. It, I, 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 I often run into this question. Um, I just, I'm not completely certain it would have been any easier from that perspective, uh, had I been white. Okay, but the story, again, stays somewhat or unorthodox when you confess that it was, quote-unquote, white music that made you realize how black you were. Explain that, yeah, if you it would. Was. It was. Well, because, I mean, the, the real common thread, again, as, as, and I'm not trying to 
uh, push back against your point because I think it's a valid one. Um, I think were I white, I would have found some other common thread. Uh, and I, but I was black, and so the common thread for me uh, turned out to be hip hop. That was the thing that connected me uh, to the broader community, or one, one and probably the biggest thing that connected me to my broader community. Um, once I got a little older, uh, my son was born, things changed, hip hop changed a little bit. Um, that thread disappeared. Uh, and what became clear to me as I went out, you know, as I talk about in that article to explore other music, uh, <laughs> it became clear that I had to search for other threads. Hmm. Let's talk about your post-secondary life for a second here. You went to Howard sure. University in Washington, which of course is well known as being an historically, uh, overwhelmingly black university, and you called it the New York City for black people. What did that yes, mean? Yes, it was. Uh, that meant that at Howard University, uh, you could have a black kid who played Dungeons and Dragons in the building. <laughs> <laughs> to find other black kids who played Dungeons and Dragons, that's what it meant. No, in all, in all seriousness, New York is, is a place for people who, wherever you know, they were, they come here looking for something different. Um, they have this sense of being out of time, of out of the ordinary, and they come here and they find community in other people who are uh, equally different. Howard University was that sort of thing. It was one of the only places I can think of where you will go and you will find black people from all over the globe in one place, black people with all sorts of interests. I met black people at Howard University who were into Marilyn Manson. Uh, I met black people at Howard University who were into Mob Deep. Uh, it really ran the gamut in terms of what you could be. There were kids there who were from hard knock neighborhoods. There were other kids there who were fourth and fifth generation Howard University. There were kids who pledged into uh, fraternity, so typical frat kids. Then there were kids like me who had uh, no interest in that at all. Um, and so it really, really ran the gamut. It was, it was that rare sort of sanctuary for African Americans where race was almost, or racism was completely taken off of the table. And you had a kind of freedom to be an individual. Hmm. Let's explore for a few moments now something you refer to as a deeper black. And I wonder, given your life experiences, we all have an image, I guess, of what the typical African-American identity of the 20th century is. If there is such a thing, people have their own ideas of what it is. Can you compare that stereotype to your reality? Yeah, I, stereotypes are not particularly useful. Um, they're useful in the sense that they give you some sort of broad identity. So it's true that in many inner city, inner city African American communities, basketball is really important. It's not true that all black people know how to play basketball. Those, those two things are not the same thing. Um, I think it's in the subtlety. It's true that in many black communities, uh, music plays a, 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 an important role. It's not true that all black people know how to dance, though. <laughs> so I, I think one of the things, and, and I believe I, what I was using for that phrase uh, I believe I was talking about Barack Obama, and the point I was trying to make uh, in that piece and in using that phrase is Barack Obama, his blackness comes across in the way that most other black people's blackness comes across who are sort of out in the professional world, and that is in very subtle ways. It doesn't come across with them raising their fists in the air you know, every five minutes. It doesn't come across by demanding reparations if you're in the po political arena. It comes across in, in, in a subtle way, in a turn of a phrase, in a handshake, in a nod, in how your hair is cut. It's a much more subtle sort of language, as it is with any other ethnic group, I think. And I think for people who maybe aren't as familiar with that ethnic group, it's a little, uh, it's a bit um, disconcerting is not the way I'm, I'm, word I'm looking for. You can miss it. You can miss it if you're, if, if you're not particularly attuned to looking for it. Well, the comparison I've heard since so many make it to JFK is that Kennedy became the first Catholic president because he wasn't all that Catholic, quite frankly. And some have made the comparison that Obama may, be, may have become the first African-American president because, frankly, he wasn't all that black. Do you, do you share that view? I, I do not at all. Um, I think he's thoroughly black. Um, I think uh, going back again uh, to, to my example at Howard University, uh, if we were beginning to sort of slice the pie that way and eliminate whole uh, characters of whole sections of people because they had not uh, been raised in the projects, because they had not uh, had an inner city experience, I would estimate that Howard University would lose 60 percent uh, of its student population. Uh, my spouse, for instance, uh, was raised in the suburbs of Chicago uh, in, a, in a totally, totally, uh, completely white uh, environment. 
she came to Howard University because she was called by something. It, when you live in America, when you live in this country, it doesn't matter if you're in Hawaii, it doesn't matter if you're in Wyoming, or if you're on the south side of Chicago. It's very difficult to not be aware that you're black. It's, it's extremely, extremely difficult. It's even more difficult to have no contact uh, with black culture at all, because most white people, if only through pop culture, have some contact with, with black culture. So you're I, saying, I, even in whole, yes, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, are, are you saying that most black people are still, if you like, defined by whites in your country? No, 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 not at all. I'm saying that it's very difficult as an African American in this country to have no contact with black people. Um, and so it's, all, and it's equally difficult. In fact, I was arguing that it's harder to have no contact with black culture because black culture suffuses the pop culture. Um, mm. So it's a difficult thing to avoid. Now, I understand what you're saying, but let me try this. Uh, let me go a little further with you here. You, you are an sure, American. Please. Let's yes, talk I about am. your identity. You're an American. You're a male. You're a writer. You're a journalist. You're a New Yorker. Yes. You're a resident yes. of Harlem. Um, yes. You've got many identities, yes. but, but you're also black. Now, right. when you define someone as black, what happens to all of those other identities? Nothing. They're all true at the same time. I don't, I don't think one even necessarily takes pr primacy over the other. They're all true at, at the same time. It's just a different, a different skin you wear, but it's still your skin. But my hunch is, if a white American were to look at you, the first thing they would say is not, oh, writer, oh, American, oh, New Yorker. <laughs> no, the first thing they'd say is, you're black. That's w true. Wouldn't That's that be true. the overwhelming identification they'd make with you? That would be the overwhelming identification that they would uh, make with me. And I'd argue that someone who saw Barack Obama before he was running for president, before he was running for Senate, walking down the street in the south side of Chicago would say the same thing. So, Having said all that, how they define me is not necessarily how I define myself. So would you be okay with that kind of identification by a stranger? Sure, I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. Okay. You have um, written that Barack Obama has redefined blackness for white America. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked a moment ago about what it is about him that you still see as being particularly African-American, but how has he yeah. redefined blackness for white America? Well, I, I think, and, and, and well, first we can go from a political perspective. The, the common sort of conceit in this country was that you could not, there were, there were certain things you had to do to get a black vote, and you could not do those things. You could not do the things you needed to do to get a black vote and to and then go out into the broader world and get the votes of the rest of the country. Okay, so this was typically defined, uh, and I hate to use this as shorthand, but it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the example that most of us know about. It was typically defined by a sort of Al Sharpton approach to politics. The idea was that if you didn't cut an image as the worst thing that somebody who lived in quote unquote, I guess, Idaho or any other uh, white community didn't want to see, then you could not get the votes of blackness. The idea was, if you didn't cut a figure of opposition, black people would not like you. Barack Obama is a man who went to, oh my God, what, uh, New Mexico, who went to places like North Carolina, Virginia, areas that <laughs> Democrats had struggled to get votes themselves, got those votes, and still maintained 95% support in African American communities. So the idea of black identity as necessarily oppositional uh, to white identity is something that I think he really, if people are, I think, paying attention, are going to have to uh, take another look at. Hmm. Let's finish up on this, uh, this notion of a deeper blackness of yes. identity, of your identity, of your generation's identity, the president's generation, in fact. What is that deeper blackness that you refer to? Well, I think we have, we have certain benefits, okay? We obviously don't live in a Jim Crow era. Uh, we live, although African Americans in this country are still ferociously segregated, um, I have a blog in which I communicate with people of all races uh, every day. Uh, the technology is such that we're all in much greater virtual contact with, 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 with each other than we would have been 30, 40 years ago. We don't so much define ourselves by whether a foot is on our neck. Although that, that's part of it, okay? That was the primary part, I would argue, uh, many years ago, 30, 40 years ago. But in our familiarity, and that was the, the sort of thing I was trying to get across in that uh, Barack Obama piece. So it really doesn't matter that you grew up in Hawaii or not. It matters that when I shake your hand, you're capable of doing the handshake the way I recognize as other African Americans do things. The idea being that it's a cultural thing, as it is 
for all other ethnic groups in this country, as it was for the Irish, as it was for the Italians, as it was for the Jews. It, it becomes a cultural ethnic thing, not necessarily a, a racial a, a oppositional thing. Gotcha. ta Coates, great to meet you. The name of the book, once again, The Beautiful Struggle, and we look forward to reading you in Atlantic Monthly as well. Thanks so much for joining us on TVO tonight. Thanks for having me.